preach this night. And um, as I was thinking about, oh God, what could I study? What could I, what could I preach? And I thought about how they needed to bring the king back. And I said, oh, that'd be a good one. Then I thought about David and how he sinned and how he went before God and got right. I said, oh, that'd be a good one. Then I thought about David. I mean, just all this stuff was coming to me, how David wanted to build a house for the Lord. I thought, oh, that'd be a good one, you know? And so this afternoon I sat down and I had all these messages, right? And so I sat down and I started in 1 Samuel. I read all of 1 Samuel. I read all the way into 2 Samuel. I was like 17 chapters in and Jessica comes in and says, what are you preaching on tonight? I said, I don't know. <laughs> but tonight I want to talk to you about a, a chapter in 1 Samuel chapter number 24. Remember, we're talking about the shepherd king. And so I, I went with that idea. I went with that thought of the shepherd king. 1 Samuel chapter number 24, verse number one through verse number 15. Okay, we're going to read a lot of scripture. All right, but, but just hold on because we're going to pull some points out and, and draw some inspiration from it as we go. David has already been anointed king at this point. He's been the man that God sought to replace Saul. Saul had disobeyed and had rebelled. Saul had an unlawful sacrifice when he was told that he should wait for Samuel to sacrifice. He couldn't wait. And he went ahead and did it on his own. And therefore, Samuel told Saul, the Lord has rejected you as king. Then later on, Samuel gives Saul specific instructions for fighting. He says, I want you to go and I want you to fight. I want you to wipe out all the men, women, children, all the livestock, every flock, everything that's moving and breathing. Don't spare the king. Just go after everybody according to the word of the Lord. So Saul goes out and he fights and he spares the flocks and the sheep and he gives them to the people and he respected the word of the people more than he respected the word of the Lord. He spared the king. And Samuel comes in and, 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 and Saul greets him and says, I've done what the Lord commanded. He says, then why do I hear sheep bleeding in my ears? And he says, well, I, I feared the people because, and, and he says, therefore, this is not going to happen. The Lord's rejected you. And he turns to leave and, and, and here comes Saul grabbing a hold of the king's garment and he rips the corner of his robe off. And Samuel looks at him and says, so also the Lord has torn the kingdom from your hand. And he's given it to someone who is better than you. That person who was better than him was David. David was a man after God's own heart. David was a shepherd of his father's sheep. He took care of his father's sheep. And this is actually how David ran his kingdom. But in order to get there, David had to go through some trials and there were some challenges. There was a, a training phase that he went through. And as he was raised up, he was raised up into the kingdom. He actually became the guy who played the guitar, I'm sorry, the harp for Saul. All right, I like the guitar, so I threw that one in there. But he played the harp for Saul. Whenever a distressing spirit would come upon him, he would play and that spirit would leave. And Saul started to persecute David. He came after him and he, he tricked him into becoming his son-in-law and he tried to get him killed in the process. It's fascinating. If you just read through First and Second Samuel, the life of David is fascinating. And there came a moment where David finally had to get up and go. He had to leave. And so he left and he fled from the presence of Saul because Saul was going to kill him. And here we find that Saul is chasing David in the wilderness. And in 1 Samuel chapter number 24, starting in verse number 1, we read, Now it happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines that it was told him, saying, Take note, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Now, for all of us in this room, when we read that David was in the wilderness of En Gedi, we think of wilderness, we think of Israel, we think of desert, right? We think of that sort of thing. I've, I've traveled to Israel. It's been over 20 years now. I was 16 years old when I went there. And they took us to En Gedi. And when they took us to En Gedi, they said, bring your swim shorts, bring your towel, bring your flip-flops, all right? Because we're going to go to En Gedi. Now, I'd read the Bible and I thought, and Getty, we're going to And Getty. That's where David was hiding out in the world. Why are we bringing swim shorts? Why are we bringing a towel? And when I got there, I realized why. And Getty is like the water park of Israel. It is an amazing place. If I could have it in my backyard, I would. It is awesome, all right? There are these massive caves with waterfalls coming down and big pools filling them up. And, and, and there's, uh, if you climb up to the top, there's a spring bubbling out of the ground. We've got pictures of me down on my hands and knees drinking out of the ground. I mean, it's just an awesome, awesome place. If I was running from somebody and I had to hide somewhere, I would choose and Getty. That would be my spot, all right? He ain't never going to find me because I'm going to be going down the water slides all day long. So it says that David was in the wilderness of En Gedi. Look at verse two. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all of Israel and went to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goats. Now I find it funny that they're trying to find 
the shepherd on the rocks of the wild goats. You know, just kind of New Testament humor there, if you will. The sheep and the goats. David would not be found among the rocks of the wild goats. David was a sheep, right? David would have been one of the sheep. And so it goes on and it says this in verse number three. So he came to the sheepfolds by the road where there was a cave. And Saul went in to attend to his needs. Now look at what it says in parentheses. David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. No wonder David was staying in the recesses of the cave. Why? Because it was by the sheepfolds. Remember, David is the shepherd king. And David would have been comfortable there by the sheepfolds. And oftentimes the sheepfolds in Israel would be by a cave. In fact, they believe that Jesus, when he was born in the manger, that that was actually a lambing cave. It was a place where the sheep would go and that they would give birth, okay? I've been there in Bethlehem and in the church that they built around it, and there's this, this massive cave in the traditional site. It's pretty neat. And so David probably went into this massive cave. Remember, he had like hundreds of men that were running and fleeing the presence of Saul with him, and so that it was a very, very large cave. And the Bible says that Saul went into a tent to his knees. Now, I was taught, probably erroneously, that Saul went in to go to the bathroom. And I don't think that that's really what it's saying, because if you read the original language, it says that Saul went in to cover his feet. Now, you might be thinking, Pastor, that still makes sense, because when I go to the bathroom, I cover my feet, right? But, but I don't think so, because they wore robes. If anything, they would have uncovered their feet, right? So here, what is he saying? It's saying that Saul went in to attend to his needs. It was probably hot, it was probably dry and arid, right? And he goes into the cave to cool off. But if he's taken a rest, what's he going to do? He's going to cover his feet, right? Might have taken off his outer garment and covered his feet to stay warm in that cave while he slept and while he rested. So that makes more sense as we get into the rest of the story. I needed to, to tell you that because as we get into this, you're going to see why that's important. And he goes on in the next verse, verse number four, then the men of David said to him, this is the day which the Lord said to you, behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand that you may do to him as seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Verse five, now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut off Saul's robe. Everybody say heart. Everybody say it again, say heart. One more time loud, say heart. See, David's heart would not let him get away with something that was wrong. David's heart troubled him for he had cut off Saul's robe. Verse five, now it happened afterwards that David's heart troubled him because he cut off Saul's robe. Verse six, and he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master. Notice the the terminology. David has been anointed king. David is on the run from this king. David has an opportunity to end his flight. He can stop this. He can stop running. He can go and become king because now God has delivered into his hand his enemy. And many times in the nations, you'll find that when somebody kills the king, that they now take the throne themselves and become the new leader of that nation. In fact, you'll read about that in the Bible, that as they killed kings, they would set themselves up. And so David sees this opportunity. His men are telling him, this is your opportunity. We can get out of this cave. Even though the waterfalls are cool, we're not by the waterfalls right now, David. We're hiding, right? It's dark in here. It's cold in here. And we're done running. We'd like to go and be with our families. We'd like to go and be with everyone else. So God has done this. And and they start to put God on, right? This is the day the Lord has said to you that he will deliver your enemies into your hand. And yet David's heart troubles him because why? Because he cuts a corner of his robe. He didn't harm him. He didn't beat him up, leave him for dead. He didn't pierce him with a sword. He didn't shoot an arrow through him. No, he simply cut a corner of his garment off. And he says, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hands against him, seeing that he is the anointed of the Lord. Notice two times in that verse, he calls him anointed. See, when kings were set up in Israel, they would anoint them. What does that mean? They would take oil, and they would pour it over their heads, completely drenching them. This anointing was reserved for kings and for priests. And as they would anoint them, prophets would be anointed at times. And as they would anoint them, that oil would hit their head and it would flow down all over them, just completely saturating and drenching them, signifying that the Lord, now the oil signifying the Holy Spirit, that the Lord had come upon them. And when there was an anointing, it, it was like smearing, it was like covering, it was, it was going over them and they would come out of that anointing a changed person. 
Now they carried a new mantle, if you will, whether it be prophet, whether it be priest, or whether it be king. Saul had been anointed the king over Israel. And the Bible said that after Saul's anointing, that he was a man with a new heart. And yet he disobeyed the Lord. And so the Lord rejected him as king. And yet he still carried the anointing of God for that time. He was still the king. And David is saying, whether or not I agree with him, whether or not I think what he's doing is right, whether or not I think this is God or not God, I'm in fear of the Lord because God's anointing is upon Saul at this time and at this moment, and how dare I come against the Lord's anointed? How dare I cut the corner of his garment? Think about if someone else would have done that while Saul was in his house, right? If somebody came into Saul's house and while Saul was taking a nap, they cut the corner of his garment off and Saul found out about it, what would they do? They might have locked him up. They might have put him to death, right? And so that's why David's heart was troubling him is because he says, this is wrong for me to do something against the king. Why? Because he's the king. He recognized the authority of God on his life, even though God had rejected him. And even though he wasn't acting like it, he was being ungodly. But David says, far be it from me to do this, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. Verse seven, so David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and went on his way. Notice David won't even let his guys go against Saul. See, it would have been one thing for David to say, I'm not gonna do it, but you guys can if you want, right? Because they could have killed him. And then David would have said, oh, I'm innocent. I didn't do it. But now you can set me up as king because Saul's out of the way, right? And yet he won't even let his servants go against him. He restrained them, the Bible says with these words. He told them, I'm not going to do it. And guess what else? You're not going to do it. He's the Lord's anointed. So the Bible says that Saul got up and left. Now, the reason why I believe that covering his feet literally meant that he was taking a rest and that he was just taking his robe and warming himself is because how could they have this conversation? How could he cut a corner of his robe off? How can David be shushing them and, and, and getting them out of the way without him knowing, right? If he was just going to the bathroom, I mean, I'm pretty aware You know what I mean? And yet, here Saul is, and he doesn't know that any of this is going on. Obviously, something else was happening, right? Most likely, he was asleep there in that cave, and that's what it meant, attending to his needs. He was hot. He was tired. He was going to take his robe off, right? He's the king, and he doesn't want anybody seeing him like that, so he covers his feet up, right? And he goes to sleep there in the cave. David comes and cuts a corner off of his robe, doesn't expose him, leaves, and Saul wakes up, puts his robe back on, and the Bible says that he walked out of that cave. Now, look at what it says. Verse number eight, David also arose afterward, went out of the cave and called out to Saul saying, my Lord, the king. Stop for a second. Stop, 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 stop. Look at the heart that David has. He won't even say, hey, you old scoundrel Saul. He doesn't say, hey, stupid Saul. Doesn't say any of that, right? He doesn't come out and just say, hey, buddy. No, there's respect David arose after, went out of the cave and called on Saul saying, my Lord, the king. He still respects the anointing of God on his life. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed down. He respected him that he stooped down and he bowed before the king of Israel, even though he had been anointed king. Goes on the next verse, and David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of men who say, indeed, David seeks your harm? Verse 10, look, This day your eyes have seen that the Lord delivered you today into my hand in the cave. And someone urged me to kill you, but my eye spared you. And I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. David spoke the truth, didn't he? David is just telling him exactly what happened. Verse 11, moreover, my father, see, wow, this guy doesn't just call him my Lord, the king. He calls him my father. Why? Because he's learning in king school that God gave him from this man Saul and anybody who is their teacher, they would say, you're my father, right? Why? Because you're teaching me things right now. And David is learning, if you will know what not to do, right? But he's learning about being a king. He's learning about being the Lord's anointed. And so he calls him my father. See, yes, see the corner of your robe in my hand. For in that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, know and see that there is neither evil nor rebellion in my hand. And I have not sinned against you, yet you hunt my life to take it. 
David says, you don't see evil because evil in my hand would have been a sword with your blood on it. You don't see rebellion in my hand because rebellion would have been a spear that I would have stuck you to the ground with. And I would have came out to show that I had rebelled against you. He says, you don't see either of those things in my hand. What do you see in my hand? You see your life got spared because I cut your robe rather than cutting out your life. He says, see, take a look and see. That's what this symbolizes. That's what this signifies. Probably Saul looked at it and remembered the day that he had a corner of someone else's robe in his hand that the Lord had torn from him. And now here David is with that corner of the robe in his hand. And Saul's probably making connections going, my goodness, God tore that off out of my hand and he put it in David's hand. Let's read on in verse number 12. It says, let the Lord judge between you and me and let the Lord avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. Verse 13, as the proverb of the ancient says, wickedness proceeds from the wicked, but my hand shall not be against you. David repeats himself two times. The repetition in the Hebrew language really was talking about the emphasis. He's emphasizing something. He's saying something. It's almost like Jesus saying, verily, verily, I say to you, or truly, truly, I say to you. What is he doing? He's emphasizing, I'm about ready to drop some truth on you, so you better listen up. David is saying the same thing. He says, my hand will not be against you. And guess what else? My hand will not be against you. Why is he saying that? He's emphasizing, Saul, I'm not coming after you. I'm not here to kill you. I'm not here to dethrone you. I'm not ready to take away anything from you. It's not gonna be me that does that. It will be the Lord that does that. And he even tells him a proverb from the ancients. And it says, wickedness proceeds forth from the wicked. It seems simplistic, doesn't it? But yet, think about that. That's pretty profound, isn't it? Because the wicked, out of whatever is on the inside of them, that is what will proceed out of them. Think about if I had a water balloon in my hand filled with water and I threw it at you, right? And it hits you and it broke open. What's going to come out of it? Shaving cream? Orange juice? No, water. Why? Because that's what's inside of it, right? In the same way, you and I as Christians... If we are filled with Jesus Christ, if we are filled with the righteousness of God, only righteous things will come out of us, right? But the wicked, only wickedness can proceed from them. That's why some people get so mad at sinners and they say, why are they doing this, this and that? And they get all crazy and I'm like, they're sinners. Sinners are gonna sin, right? If you poke them, what's gonna come out of them? Unrighteousness, sin's gonna come out of them. Why? Because that's what they're filled up with. But Christians, you can know a Christian because if you're filled with the love of God, when the world pokes at you, the love of God is going to come out. You can tell the righteous because when the world starts to jostle you, the righteousness of God will pour out. You can tell somebody that's full of God because when the world squeezes in and when the pressure comes on your life, God is going to come out of your life. Preaching better than you're saying amen. Amen. It's all good. Verse 14, after whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom do you pursue? A dead dog? A flea? I love that. David didn't view himself as anything. He viewed himself as a dead dog. Dogs were detestable to Israel. Not only a dog, a dead dog. See, anything dead, if you got around it, you would become unclean. And so he gives him a detestable, unclean animal. He says, is that, is that what you came seeking me? Just a dead dog? And then he goes one step further, not even the dog, but the little speck, the little irritating, biting, little nasty flea on the back of that dead dog. Did you come out against a dead dog, a flea? You know what he's saying? Little old me. Is that who you're here for? Because I'm not anything. I have no ability to come against you. I, I'm not a nuisance. I'm not here to... Take away your throne, verse 15. Therefore, let the Lord be judge and judge between you and me. Once again, he repeats this. There's repetition in what he's saying. Let the Lord judge between you and me. Let the Lord judge between you and me. In other words, David is committing himself to the care and the power of God. He's not gonna exalt himself to become king. No, he's gonna let God do it in his time, in his way. And see and plead my case and deliver me out of your hand. You can read on and hear Saul's response. Saul repents. He, he cries before David. This is not the only time that this happens. Later on, Saul tries it again. And so we can see that David has some characteristics and some qualities. And I want to talk to you about what made David a great shepherd and a great king. The things that made David a great shepherd 
and a great king. And I believe that if we look at these things and if we incorporate these things into our lives, it'll make us just like David. But guess what else? It'll make us just like Jesus. And I'll show that to you as we go throughout. A couple of things tonight. What made David a great shepherd? What made David a great king? First thing is this. What made great David a great shepherd and a great king is honor. It made David great in the eyes of God. Because God says, whoever honors me, I will honor. That's an amazing promise, isn't it? That if we can honor God as our father, God as king supreme, if we can give honor to whom honor is due. Why? Because God is the one who set them up and put them in that position of authority, whether it be here in church, whether it be a pastor, whether it be a leader, whether it be the authorities, the government. You know, I always cringe when I see Christians starting to speak out against leaders of our nation. Guys, I do not agree with everything of this administration. I don't agree with everything of the previous administration. I don't agree with everything of the administration before the previous administration. But here's the deal. I honor all of them. Why? Because God put them in that position of authority. God raised them up for that time. God raised them up for that day. And they were God's servant for that hour. Now, whether they did what God wanted them to or not is none of my business. My business is to pray for them, to respect them, to honor them, and to lift them up before the real king, the one who has their heart in his hands, who can turn it like a water course wherever he desires. That's my piece in this whole thing. Not to speak out against them. Not to talk about them disrespectfully and rude. They are the leaders of our nation. Same thing in our state. Oh my goodness. Have you noticed lately that our state has lost their minds? They need our prayers. They don't need our bitterness and our complaints. They need us to hit our knees and to lift them up before the Lord. And if they're not doing what they should be doing, then God remove them and give us some leaders after your own heart, just like David. But while they're in office, I'm gonna honor them. I'm gonna honor the king. I'm gonna honor, if you will, our president. All of our senators, the House of Representatives, I'm gonna honor our mayor, right? Our mayor is a godly man and he is an awesome man of God. He deserves our respect. You may not like him. You may not understand what he's doing or why he's doing it. You may have liked the previous mayor or some other person that was running, but listen, he's the man of the hour right now. He's the one that God raised up and put in that position of authority. He also happens to be a brother in the Lord. And therefore, he deserves double honor, our respect. He, was, he, he deserves our prayers, we need to honor those that God has put over us. That's why in the marriage, there needs to be an honor between husband and wife. That's why in, in the different circles that we go in, we need to find out, you know, Jesus did never revile against the high priest. He spoke the truth. And when he was beaten because of it, he turned and he said, if I've spoken evil, tell me what I did. But if not, then why do you hit me? He never went against the high priest, never came against him like that. The apostle Paul Find out when he spoke against the high priest, he called him the whitewashed sepulcher and somebody struck him on the jaw. He said, don't talk to the high priest that way. And he goes, oh, is that the high priest? I'm sorry. Why? Because there was an honor, there was a respect that was deserved because God set them up. Not because of man, not because of who they are, if they were doing the right thing. No, the high priest was out of order when he was talking to Paul, right? Here he is persecuting him. And yet, when the apostle Paul saw, oh, wait a second, that's the high priest? I'm sorry, my bad. Honor, honor was what brought David. Because even though David was anointed king, he still respected the anointing that was on Saul as the current king. David would not sin against Saul, nor would he sin against God by disrespecting or disobeying the authority that God had placed in Israel. And in fact, you find out later on, if you continue to read the story, that when Saul was actually uh, was killed, the Bible tells us that he was running from the enemy and he realized that he was wounded, that he had been hit by archers and he knew his time was up, but he knew that that was gonna be a slow death. And so he went to his armor bearer and he said, I need you to run me through. And his armor bearer was so in fear that he wouldn't do it. So Saul, the Bible says, fell on his sword in 1 Samuel. Now in 2 Samuel, we find out there was more to this story. Uh, a young man comes up to David and he says, hey, I wanted to let you know what happened. I found Saul there lying on his sword and he told me I'm dying, but, but I don't want to fall into the hands of the enemy. Go ahead and run me through. And so he says, so I ran him through and then I came here to tell you about it, thinking that that was a good thing. And yet David turns and says, how dare you touch the Lord's anointed? And he calls on the young men and tells them to execute the one who killed Saul. Wow, even in this wicked king's death, David laments and he mourns over him and he executes the person who put him to death because he says, how dare you touch the Lord's anointed? That was honor. Second thing, what made David a great shepherd and a great king? The second thing is this, is David's humility. 
David's humility. Just as you heard last week when Pastor Jim was talking about David, that after David was anointed king, he went back to the sheepfold to be with God. Two times you find David running back to the sheep. In fact, the Bible tells us that often he went to feed his father's sheep, even though he had a job in the palace playing that harp, even though he had become the victor, and even though he was a mighty man of war, and the Bible says he went out before Saul and he behaved wisely, he still continued to have a heart for God, and that sheepfold was the place where he connected with God. And so here David comes. God often reminds him of this, and David will often say, who am I, right? Here when David comes and he wants to build a house for God and here he is getting ready to to build a house for God and Nathan the prophet says, do whatever's in your heart, David, man, it's all good, go ahead. That can't be a bad thing, just go ahead and do it. And as David goes and, and, and leaves, then Nathan has a dream and a vision and God speaks to him and says, David has too much blood on his hands, he can't do this for me, he's not gonna build a house for me. And by the way, all the time that I've been with Israel, have I ever dwelt in a house of cedar or wood? Have I not dwelt in tents and tabernacles? I didn't ask David to do this thing. He says, but because David desired to build me a house, he says, I will build for him a house and his kingdom shall go on forever and ever. God starts to declare that Jesus Christ is gonna come through the lineage of David and be king forever in his line, enthroned on the throne of his father, David. And so here God sends Nathan to David and when David hears this, he's overwhelmed in his response is, who am I? And who is my father's house that you would build for me a kingdom and a name like you would God? See, David understood that it wasn't because of who he was, but it's because of who God is. David understood that if I will humble myself and just utterly depend on God, that's what true humility is. Not just belittling yourself, I'm nothing, I'm a worm, I'm this, right? Even though David did call himself a dead dog and a flea. But David was just reliant on God. What did he say? God will judge between you and me. David was reliant on the timing, the will, and the plan of God. It wasn't about David's timing. It wasn't about David's will, and it wasn't about David's plan. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna kill Saul, then I'm gonna go after his kids, and then I'm gonna go out, and I'm gonna be anointed as king in Hebron, and then I'm gonna do all, no, David didn't have any of that. All he had was a heart for God that said, God, whatever you wanna do, I'm gonna do that. God, if you wanna make me king, if you've anointed me, then whenever you're ready, God, you make it happen. God, whatever it is that you wanna do, you know, sometimes people get discouraged when they have a word from the Lord. I've heard people that get a word at a young age, you're gonna be a pastor, you're gonna be a missionary, you're gonna do great things for God. God is gonna use you to do mighty things. And then they go out and they try and make it happen in their own power and they make a mess of things. And it's like, wait a second, you just got way out ahead of God. You you were never meant to get way out ahead of God. They say, well, I don't wanna be trailing behind, I don't wanna be just sitting there doing nothing. No, God wants you to get right there with him. Step by step, step by step, God is saying, just come beside me. In my timing, in my will, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. If God has spoken a word to you, let that illuminate, not all the way up ahead. Don't get running out there. Pastor, I'm gonna get there. Missionary, all right, honey, let's sell the house. Let's get the kids and let's go off to Equatorial Guinea, right? Don't get out ahead of God if you don't have a word for what the next step is. If you don't know, if you know that God has told you, hey, one day there's great things in your life, just like David was anointed king. You may have been anointed for something mighty on the earth. Maybe it was for business. Maybe you had a vision of a great family. Maybe you've been waiting. God had spoken something to you that that right person has come along. And here you are, six years later, going, God, you told me, but I still don't see it. Just humble yourself. And get right underneath God, get right underneath the plan. And when the pillar of cloud moves by day and when the pillar of fire moves by night, that's when you get up and you go, you don't move until you see God move. You don't do until you see God do. You only speak what he says. You only go out and do what you see him doing. See, don't get out ahead of God and don't trail behind God. Get right there with God. Just like David, he had a heart that was humble. He didn't seek honor. He didn't parade himself as something, but he simply relied on God. What made David a great shepherd? What made David a great thing? Last thing is this, is heart. Honor, humility, and heart. It was David's heart that God sought after to lead the people as their king. God doesn't look at outward appearances. In fact, if you read in in, uh, 1 Samuel chapter number 16, it talks about how Samuel went in to Jesse's house and he looked at his oldest son. He said, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. God says, nope, not him, I've rejected him. Even though he was handsome, even though he was tall, just like Saul, the Bible tells us that Saul was tall, he was a head taller than everybody else, he was handsome, he was good looking. 
And so here Samuel had that in mind. Oh, God was looking at height, appearance. Sure, this guy's got the movie star quality. He's going to be the one to lead. So here he goes to Jesse's house, and Eliab, the oldest brother, comes in, tall, dark, and handsome. And he says, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. And God says, no, I've rejected him. Because I don't look on the outward appearance. I look at the heart. Remember, David was a man after God's own heart. What was in David's heart? What was in David's heart was, God, what's in your heart? God, I want your heart. God, I want to know you. God, I want to follow you. God, I just want to be with you. That's why he kept going back to those sheep. Why? Because that was the place that he could just sing to God. He could just have his alone time. He had that solitude where it was just him and God. And yeah, a bunch of sheep. And every now and then a lion and a bear that God delivered into his hand. But see, it was also David's heart that troubled him when he cut off the corner of Saul's robe. David had a heart that would not allow him to get into sin. Saul had a heart to be accepted by the people, but David had a heart for the Lord. That's why Saul was rejected and David was received. Think about it this way, right? We all know that, that Saul sinned, right? Saul got off. But you know, David also sinned, right? And not just once. There was the incident with Bathsheba. Then that sin rolled into another sin with Uriah, her husband, right? He had him murdered. Then later on down the road, you'll find David messed up by numbering the children of Israel, the Bible says Satan raised up to, to stir that thing up. And so David relented of that and went before the Lord. See, David had a lot of mess ups. David was not perfect. David was not the perfect father. If you read about his family, his family was a mess. And yet, through all of this, David is still the greatest king that Israel had ever known. Why? Because while Saul sinned and went after the praises of the people, David sinned and repented before God and went after God in those moments. He never got off God. He continued to seek God. David wanted to be right with God. David repented. See, Saul was rebuked by a prophet and David was rebuked by a prophet. But when Saul was rebuked by the prophet, he said, I've sinned. Now honor me before the people and go and sacrifice with me. Let me sacrifice so that I can be seen as something before the people. And yet David, when he sinned, he repented and said, Lord, against you and you only have I sinned. And he ran to God in those moments and he repented before God. I mean, that's why in Psalm 51, after the incident with Bathsheba, David writes this beautiful psalm of repentance. And he says in verse number 10, created me a clean heart. Oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. David knew that it wasn't about external things. It wasn't about the sacrifice. It wasn't about going and having a burnt offering or a sin offering. It was about the heart. David said, if you wanted those things, I'd give them to you. But God, those are not the sacrifices. The sacrifices you want are a broken and a contrite spirit. If you're in this place tonight, you're in a place where you want to become great, just like this man, David then these are three things that I believe that if you will get on the inside of you, these attributes are what make us great before the Lord. Think about Jesus for a second. Jesus was honorable, wasn't he? Jesus honored his father. Jesus never exalted himself. He didn't take any glory for himself. He said, I'm, I'm here to just point everyone to God. I'm here to declare to you the father. It's my father whom I'm coming to give glory to. It's him, the one that I'm bringing honor to. Jesus was honorable. Jesus was humble. He was the humble king. Bible says he came lowly and riding on a donkey. And we see Jesus as that humble king. Jesus did not exalt himself. No, Jesus just got right underneath the plan of God. Jesus didn't get out ahead of God. Jesus didn't trail behind God. No, Jesus was right there. Whatever I see, I do. Whatever I hear, I speak. Jesus was humble, but Jesus had heart. He had the greatest heart that we will ever know. And tonight, I want to encourage you guys that in these three areas, honor, humility, and heart, that as you incorporate them into your lives, you will see the greatness of God in every area of your life. You know, all of us want to live a great life, don't we? All of us at the end of our life, we want our life to count for something. We want it to be significant. We want someone to know that we made an impact on the planet and that our life while we were here on the earth made a difference, that it wasn't just, you know, a picture on a, on a wall that somebody sells at a yard sale someday and they can't even remember our names. We want our life to have significance, but not just significance here on the earth, but significance on into eternity. God is saying tonight that if you will incorporate these things in your life, that after everything's all said and done, even though you may make mistakes, even though you may not do everything right, just like David, that God will say, they were a man after my own heart. They were a woman after my own heart. And their life goes on into eternity. It counts for something. 
Let's pray together. Father, we thank you tonight for the example that we have of the shepherd and the king, David. Lord, what a man. What an example for all of us, God. Lord, I want to be like him. I want to have that heart that just seeks after you. Lord, I want to have that humility that desires just to come underneath your will and your plan. God, I want to be a man of honor, integrity, God. Lord, I I want to honor those whom you honor, God, and have that heart that doesn't revile, doesn't complain, God, but simply trusts in who you are and what you're doing on the earth. Father, I thank you, Lord, that this heart that we see in David, that we see in Jesus, the humble king, the honorable king, the king who had the greatest heart that we have ever known, Lord, and how has given that heart to us, Lord, that we would be more and more like Jesus each and every day. Would you just take a moment right now in this quiet, in this silence, would you just ask this question, God, what are you speaking to me? Just pray that prayer right now in this moment. God, what are you speaking to me? Quiet your soul right now. Don't don't get distracted. Focus in. God, what are you speaking to me? And then listen for his voice. The stillness of your heart. right now by the spirit that there are those of you that are getting a picture God has greatness ahead of you some of you it's a ministry calling some of you it's a business you got a picture thank you Lord stick with God humble yourself trust his timing he'll make it happen you don't have to get out ahead of him He'll make it happen. Just do what he tells you to do as he tells you to do it. Thank you, Jesus. What's God speaking to you? Thank you, Lord. So you God is speaking a word to repent. Like David, to run to him. Maybe you've been so ashamed and you haven't been able to come to God. But tonight, can I encourage you to just pray in this moment? Say, God, I'm sorry. God, forgive me. And then repent. Repentance means a total change of mind and a change of direction where you were going away from God. Now you're going towards God. Run to him. Don't run from him. Run to him. The Bible tells us whoever confesses and renounces their sin, that they are forgiven that their sin is blotted out. Just take a moment and talk to him about it right now. I believe for some of you in this place tonight, God is saying, stay in there. Stay in there. The road's been long. The journey's been tough. But stay in there. Stay in there. Don't let your heart be discouraged. But like David, strengthen yourself in the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. If God spoke something to your life, would you just write it down? I know when I don't write stuff down, I forget it. And I lose it. So maybe you want to take a moment, just write it on a note in your phone or tablet, or maybe you got a piece of paper, even in the leaf of your Bible. If God spoke something to you personally, maybe it's a scripture, write that reference down and go look it up later. Sit down with a pen and paper. Just journal out what God is talking to you about. Let the Spirit just write through you. Let Him speak to you in that moment. 
Some of you guys are here with a spouse or a faith-filled friend and you just want to share that with them for accountability or maybe you just want them to know and, and, and you want to share that with somebody just to be encouraged that there's a mutual faith going on. You're welcome to share that with your husband or wife. Maybe you're here with a faithful friend, like I said, and you just want to show them what God's speaking to you. Not to boast, not, not any other reason than just to say, hey, this is what I believe God is telling me about. Would you encourage me in this? Would you help me to continue on in this? God gave us godly people around us and faithful friends to encourage us and to move us forward. Sometimes when the road gets long, it's good to go back to somebody and say, you remember what I showed you? Yeah, how's that going? Not so good. We'll keep going. Stay in there. Man, we need that from time to time. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We receive it with meekness, God. In Jesus' name. just want to take the last couple moments tonight before we leave. I'm going to ask everybody to remain seated. No one get up, no one leave. And I want to talk to you about your eternal life. Be a tragedy for us to come into the house of God and worship the Lord. And man, didn't the team do great tonight? Bringing our hearts before God. Be a tragedy for us to listen to the word of God and really get something. You guys have been wonderful tonight. I could tell you were getting something for the word of God. You guys were leaning in to the word. Be a tragedy if we did all that and we let you go. You went out, got in your car, and you started your car, and your heart stopped. You died. 